igual. We gather here today in the name of the Lord to praise, pray, and worship. So let us rejoice. I'd like to say good morning and uh, thank you for joining me. I'd also like to uh, thank everyone who's going to be watching on YouTube later. And uh, thank you for watching. So let's take a moment and look at our bulletin for the announcements. Um, one thing, I've made a few, a few notes. Uh, next Sunday is Communion Sunday, and I again encourage everyone to bring a friend. Um, we also have uh, our consistory meeting has been moved to November 9th. Uh, which is a Wednesday instead of the 8th. And then next Saturday is an extra thought is craft fair. In, um, they're going to have a, the soup, the chili, their craft fair, and it's uh, to support Camp Followers Ministry. Um, we also have uh, a couple more weeks for our fall basket raffle. Um, the drawing will be on the 13th at 1 o'clock. We need a few more deacons. Um, if you'd like to know any more about it, don't be afraid to ask. And then uh, the Historic Society is going to be meeting on November 2nd from 7 to 9. And the program is about, the, uh, about Parker Francis Dunn. And he was the person that Dunn Memorial Bridge was named after. So if you'd like to know more about that bridge and that person, uh, by all means, please show up. Then we also have some uh, food pantry needs and IPH needs. Um, Sandy's been gracious enough. She's got her hand up. <laughs> IPH, I want to thank everybody for bringing all the donations. It's been great. But this, I went the other day and they need bags, like bags of hand tools. Like if you have a ton of those reusable bags around, or even uh, paper bags and handles. The grocery bags with the, the handles? And then I noticed that they're also in they're also in need of uh, sneakers for men and women, uh, blankets, towels, and linens for beds and uh, for personal hygiene, of course. And then um, I know in my house I have a few winter coats in the closet that I don't use anymore. So we can all know that it's getting cold outside. We don't have to be told that. Um, and then Rusty had handed me another little piece about. Um, some more announcements this morning. And the one is the Hilltop Music. The Hilltop Ministries will be having their Thanksgiving combined worship service Tuesday the 22nd at 7 a.m. Or 7 p.m., sorry. Yeah, 7 a.m. <laughs> Whoa. And then they dad's called for it. Everyone is invited. And then we have some things that we'll get to on our prayer concern. So with that, are there any other announcements? Um, for the... Uh, election Day bake sale. I need someone to fill in from two to four-ish. Um, I have a treatment scheduled that day, and I cannot make it uh, at that time frame. So I need someone to just hang out from two to four-ish uh, for Election Day so bake sale. So on bake sale Tuesday, right. uh, you need someone to fill in from two to four at the uh, firehouse. Right? Firehouse, okay. yeah. And then Sandy, did you have? No, that? I said I, I think I signed up for twelve to eleven. And Rusty, we have a worship committee meeting after church service today. We're going to plan on Christmas Eve. Everyone's invited. I appreciate everyone's input. So after worship service today, we'll have a worship committee meeting. So after worship today, worship committee meeting to plan Christmas. Anyone else? Oh, yeah. As far as um, the basket raffle goes, we are still doing Wednesday nights and Sundays until the 13th. Um, and also, as far as um, food pantry goes, we're still in need of um, at least probably one more turkey and some some more buns. If you have cash or check, you put a little memo on it that says food pantry and give it to Linda or I. So food pantry. We still need another turkey, and if you're going to donate, uh, put food pantry on your 
Anyone else? Well, of course, we also have to remember that tomorrow's Thanksgiving, or uh, Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> Halloween. So watch out for those, you gotta watch out for those little monsters, right? <laughs> and then, uh, now let's direct your attention to your prayer concerns. Um, I have a few listed here. Um, one is April Bell, health concerns. She's uh, Marie Tompkins' uh, granddaughter. And then, of course, we need to continue to pray for Dee uh, Clink. And her son, Joey, now has some health concerns. And then, uh, please keep Margaret Cook in your prayers. Her sister, Noreen, passed away on Wednesday, and she was part of the Steeple Bell Committee. Uh, so please keep her in her family in your prayers. Are there any other prayer concerns? Sandy? Octavia's friend, uh, he was in an accident Thursday night. Um, as of yesterday, it was he was in critical condition, but um, not sure. I haven't gotten any updates today, but it wasn't looking great. So, yeah, so please if we Octavia's can keep, friend yeah. Answer. Thank you. So as we begin our worship today, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty and gracious God, please continue to show us your goodness and mercy. We invite you to be present and with us today by the power of the Holy Spirit. We declare that we love you and thank you for making your way of love known through your Son, Jesus. We pray that you reveal his greatness of love to us as we gather and worship here today. Lead us by your Holy Spirit to praise you. Through your name, dear Lord. May our hearts overflow with thanksgiving and our mouths proclaim your everlasting greatness now and forever. Amen. So if you would, please join me in our responsive call to worship as it's found in your bulletin. O God, you are righteous. O God, your judgments are upright. O God, your guidance or precept in our lives is unforgettable. So then come and let us worship the Lord. Amen. And our first hymn will be number 349, Trust and Obey.
which is our confession of sins. So let us all bow our heads in prayer. Lord, we've made mistakes and wandered from your way. We humble ourselves before you and seek forgiveness. Dear Lord, we pause now so that you can hear our silent prayers of confession. As we have confessed our sins in silence, now let us confess our sins to each other and pray for each other so that we may be healed. Remember the prayer of a righteous person are powerful and effective. So please join me in the prayer of confession found in your bulletin. Almighty God, you have set before us the path, but we have wandered on our own to try to find our own way. Sometimes we hear your call and we come back, but times we see little children testing boundaries, ignoring your call until fear finally makes us look back. And times, dear Lord, we are full of youthful rebellion, demanding to cut loose and separate, not knowing how much we still need to seek your wisdom and guidance. But most of the time, dear Lord, too often we think we're adults and have figured it all out. We think that we know our own way, our own soul, and stray from your path. Remind us, dear Lord, that you are our Father, that we always are your children, that we have never fully grown up in your sight, and that we always have much to learn. Help us to seek and move every day. Allow us the knowledge that we need of your wisdom and guidance, and help us to return to your path so that we may walk with you. In the name of Christ, who is our companion on our journey of faith, we pray. Amen. And now, for our assurance of pardon, we hear these words. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, Slow to anger and abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. The Lord does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our poor behavior. For as high as the heaven is above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our sins from us. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. And then in the summary of the law, Jesus said, when asked, Master, what is the great commandment in the law? And Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love thy Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And Jesus gave the second commandment, and he said, It was like unto the first, and repeated both. Jesus then said, On these two great commandments, and all the law and the prophet. Amen. Then I acknowledged my sin. 
given to you, and I did not hide my inequity. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin, Salah. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with glad cries of deliverance. Salah. Amen. Well, those of you that know me should know by now that I like to Google things. Um, so, uh, this is no different. Um, so I had to look up why we said Salah at the end of a few of those responses in the response agreement. So, anybody? All right, well, good. Um, so the word Salah was used 74 times in the Hebrew, Hebrew Bible. Uh, the Google search said that the precise meaning was unknown, but much of the interpretation said that it was a musical mark or an instruction on the reader uh, that was singing to stop and to listen or to pause and reflect. So when you look back through that song later on, you'll see that uh, the prompting and the considering the emphasis on God who has placed his promise in on that truth is really why that word Salah is repeated so many times. And then you'll see later that it's going to be repeated again and again in today's message. So, other people say that uh, it could mean forever, Amen, or Hallelujah. And the fact is that Salah was used three times as much in the Old Testament to emphasize the important parts of that psalm itself. So, you be the decider, right? You, you make those decisions. So now, as we prepare our time of scripture for today's message, please join me in a responsive reading, uh, not in your bullet. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under the conscious pilot. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he arose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he will become to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. And now we're ready for a little musical meditation.
Help us to provide care and comfort for those in need. You have provided warmth in our hearts and food on our table. So please, Lord, as we head into this season of Thanksgiving, give us the strength and resources to help provide for our neighbors in the same way that you have provided for us. Let us walk in your path. As we continue to bow our heads in prayer before you, we ask that you watch over us, our families, our friends, and those who are struggling to believe. Please, Lord, remove all pain from those in pain, remove the suffering from those who are suffering. And we ask that you provide wisdom to the doctors so they know what to do. You see who is on our prayer list, dear Lord, and you know who is not on our list. Please be with Margaret as for the loss of her sister, the Clint family as they uh, struggle with their health concerns, Diane with her and her sister, and April as she is on a prayer list too. And as they all have health concerns or healing needs, please touch them, dear Lord, with your healing touch. Protect our troops, dear Lord, and keep them safe. Protect those firefighters and police. You've touched their hearts and called them to serve, and they will be your, our shield as you are the, our shield too. Help us to follow your commands, dear Lord. We often experience uncertainties and we don't know what to do. We make our own paths clearer. And please, Lord, make it clearer for us to see your way. Allow us to see and follow in your footsteps. And Lord, we continue to be thankful. Thankful for your caring, your mercy, and your guidance. We too often ask for things in prayer and too often forget to give thanks for you for all that you've given Lord, you provide, and we are thankful. We lift up our prayer and praise to you, dear Lord, so that you may hear us, and now we will join together in the prayer that you've taught us to say, to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debts. So now let's sing a little sing a song of praise. Our next hymn is 377. Jesus, I am across the table.
Guide us and enlighten us as we seek to know you through your word of the Holy and the Holy Spirit. And may we be held by your light so that our hearts may be open and become your light to shine through us onto the world. We pray that we receive every word that is spoken today through Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. So the scripture I chose today was from the New Testament. The book of Luke, chapter 19, verses 1 through 10. My reading is from the New International Version. For some reason it seems that I keep being drawn to those parables, so you know what to get when you get me as a preaching elder. <laughs> uh, so you can follow along in your pew Bible. Uh, it starts on page 1098. Hear these words. He entered Jericho and was passing through it. A man was there named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see. Because he was going to pass that way, uh, when Jesus came to that place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. All who saw it began to grumble and said, He is going to be with a guest of one who is a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, Look, half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I have defrauded anyone or anything, I will pay back four times as much. Then Jesus said to them, to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is the son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and to save the lost. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So as I read the scripture today, preparing for today's sermon, I reflected on my Sunday school days. Uh, this was one of those stories in scripture that was a scripture passage that if you sang it as a child and you practiced singing it for a while, you remember it forever. So with a little bit of help from Wally, here comes my best try. <laughs> All right. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, and a very little man was he. He climbed up into a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. For the Lord he wanted to see. And when the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree. And Jesus said, now Zacchaeus, you come down from there, from coming to your house to stay, from coming to your house today. Zacchaeus was a wee little man, but a happy man was he. For he had seen the Lord that day, and a happy man was he. A very happy man was he. Thank you, <laughs> You got your best word. So let's take a moment to get to know a little bit of background about Zacchaeus and what's, what's, what's his story, right? Like, let's see. It was a cute little nursery rhyme. It was easy to remember in Sunday school. Um, it was fun to practice with Junior Wally the other night, uh, just so that I was at least sort of in tune, right? Um, so he was a short little guy, and he was a tax collector, right? So then tax collectors were hated and they were regarded as the worst of sinners. They were the Jews who were working for the Romans. They were seen as a symbol figure because there was no remorse. They were, were self-enriching. Uh, they were considered traitors to the Jews because they still worked for the Romans. Basically, these folks were considered, considered those sellouts, and they pretty much could do whatever they wanted because the Romans only wanted so much but the people didn't know how much was so much. So those tax collectors could just make it whatever they felt like, and the person had no way to pay, no way to know what not to pay, so they had to pay. Right? So a little more history was that uh, the Romans controlled the taxation in, the ancient, in ancient Israel. They divided it into three districts. They hired men uh, to be like district commissioners, they generally picked a person who bid the highest to be the tax collector. Um, and Zacchaeus, which 
means he was one of the groups that worked for the tax people, uh, was a simple fact that he was a greedy extortionist. That, that was the bottom line. They were the thugs and they pressured and intimidated the common people of Israel and they got what they wanted. So in today's world, Zacchaeus would have had plenty of company. Um, make no mistake, if you don't pay your taxes, you'll be up that tree with Zacchaeus, right? You'll be up there. Um, but the story has a different time and a different meaning for today. So in our scripture, our Bible story in the New Testament, this is perhaps one of the best known and best loved because it was that vacation Bible school story. There basically is five lessons to be learned in that piece of scripture. So this scripture takes place at the end of Jesus' life. In verses 1 and 2, it's the circumstance of the story. He's entering Jericho and he was passing through it. It was, he is in a it, he is only days away from Jerusalem, and that crucifixion is going to happen. He had to be going through. He had to have gone through Jericho many times, and this being his final time, Jericho, so you know, was one of these important cities in ancient Israel. Um, everything went through it. It was a tropical plain. It was six miles west of the Jordan River. Um, it was the center for trade, commerce, business, industry, agriculture. Um, and it was an important city for generations. If we had a giant map, uh, you would see that everything went through Jericho to go anywhere in the Middle East. So Jericho was also known for two things. It was known for the balsam, which was uh, grown there and sold through ancient, the ancient nearby east. And that was the resin that was used for fragrances. And it was also known for growing and harvesting produce uh, dates and date nut trees. So, what this meant was Jericho in Jesus' day was a good place to be because you knew you were doing good and you knew you could make a lot of money there. It was also a good place if you had any good ideas uh, where, and you were willing to work hard, those good ideas would come to tuition. You would end up being able to follow through. So a lot of things went through Jericho and a lot of things came back. So now back to the scripture. So Jesus comes to Jericho on his way to Jerusalem, uh, where it would be his last time as we now know. By now he's well known, he's like the rock star of the time. Uh, everyone either loved him or hated him. Um, most people knew of his ministry for the three and a half years that he was uh, preaching his, whip, his word, and then you couldn't ignore him. So he's getting ready to spread the word again, coming through Jericho, and hundreds, maybe even thousands of people flock to those streets. Um, it was groups of people lined up on both sides. They would be looking to say, oh, they want to talk to him. Oh, they would want to hear him. Oh, they want to touch his sleeve. And maybe even he perform a miracle so that they could see that. Boy, wouldn't we all want to see that too, you know? You'd, you'd sit there and knew he was coming and be like, hey, I got to go see that. Right? You wouldn't want to miss it. So he's come for, uh, to Jericho in the greatest of all possible fanfare. Everybody's heard of him. Everybody wants to see him, uh, including Zacchaeus, the most hated man in town. Right? So here comes Zacchaeus, and everybody's like, oh boy. And here comes that tax collector. So he had three strikes against him. Poor old Zacchaeus, not just that he was a tax collector, but remember, that was the first thing. And they weren't white. No more light now than then. And then number two, he was a crook and a cheat. And then number three, he worked for that hated Roman Empire. So his three strikes were tax collector, crooked, a cheat, and he was hated. And he represented everything that was wrong or bad in life and about everything they knew as being wrong and bad in life. So when folks saw the key is coming, they wanted to get away from him because they didn't want to even have anything to do or even be close to him. So our first lesson in scripture was that Zacchaeus has learned the hard way that one of the most basic lessons in life was, we all know it, you can be rich but not happy, you can be wealthy but not loved, and you can be successful but not satisfied. Zacchaeus 
and all of us know that money couldn't buy us happiness and money can't buy us love. So we knew that and we've all been taught that over the years. Either someone told us or we learned it the hard way. Right? The second lesson was that Zacchaeus was determined to see Jesus, so he climbed up in that tree. Right? So he climbed up in the sycamore tree. So we don't really believe that he was going to like just push his way through the crowd. Like, you know, you see somebody you don't like, you generally kind of block their path. You might uh, put a stick in their way, put a foot in their path, right? Kind of block it so that they weren't able to get through. Those times were no different. So, since everybody hated this guy, uh, not now, not any year, they were going to let him by. So Zacchaeus can't fight his way through, so he's determined, and he moves slowly through the streets. He spies a sycamore tree, goes up the road, climbs up into the tree, and it was something like an oak with big branches, so it was easy to get in, and he climbs up into the tree and drapes himself over the limb, waiting for the Lord. Right, so he's just kind of hanging out in that tree. So why? So the real question is, but why? Why did he go up there? He is supposed that Zacchaeus had heard through the tax collector grapevine that Jesus was uh, a man who had met Levi. And those of you that don't know who Levi was, uh, Levi was also a tax collector. But what happened was Levi met Jesus, and then Jesus turned Levi into one of his disciples, and he became our disciple Matthew. So now all of a sudden, maybe Zacchaeus was like, hmm, if he can sway Matthew, Levi, maybe he can sway me. Or do you suppose that he called out his colleague and he, do you think it's possible that Zacchaeus for all his money had a hole in his heart maybe? Maybe there was just an emptiness and he thought that Jesus could fill that void. Right? Maybe he could fill it. So, out of desperation, he'd do anything to see Jesus and maybe have a hope of seeing a miracle. So consider this. If you had taken a poll in that day, who was the most hated man in Jerusalem or Jericho? Zacchaeus. If you said, who was the worst man in town? Zacchaeus. And then if you said, once again, who was at the top of the list of least likely to be able to see Jesus? Everybody would have said, Zacchaeus. Right? That poor guy had it all against him. People had written Zacchaeus off as a crook, a tax collector, and someone that when you saw him coming, nobody wanted anything to do with him. He was down and out. Right? Down and out. But when Jesus comes down the road, he sees a man up a tree, pun intended. Right? So he sees a man up a tree, and a man everybody hates, and Jesus wants to enter his home and enter his life. It's like, whoa, what happened? We might all be able to relate to being up that tree and want Jesus to re-enter our life. So our second lesson was to learn something in the effect that the gospel that we shared, uh, sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes our friends, our loved ones, and our neighbors don't want to listen. You might want to have something that you want to share and nobody wants to hear it. Um, well, we try to share work. We try to share Christ with our friends and family. We try to build those bridges. We try to get people to know who Jesus is. And we might even get discouraged. Sometimes we go months, years, and sometimes there's no response at all. But we look at them and then we conclude they're never going to get it. Right? Zacchaeus reminds us not to jump to that hasty conclusion, but to look outside, on the outside of you, not to write anyone off. In Zacchaeus' heart, the Holy Spirit was working. And it was just waiting for that day that Jesus was going to come and arrive and enter into his home and his heart. So there's no when. It'll just happen when it happens. The third lesson was about salvation. Right? So in the salvation piece, here comes this crowd down the street. Jesus is in the middle. There's a lot of commotion, a lot of uh, excitement. Verse 5. Uh, when Jesus reaches the spot underneath the tree where Zacchaeus was, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately, right? He called him out. 
So, how Jesus knows Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus' is name, like, how did that happen? So, do we know? No, we don't know. So, it's a good question, and I didn't know the answer. So, did somebody spot Zacchaeus? Did somebody, you know, like, oh, well, there's that creep Zacchaeus up in the tree. Right? Did they call him out? Like, did everybody start pointing and, and making him, like, be a spectacle? I don't know. Or did Jesus somehow recognize a hungry heart? So did he see that person up a tree and go, hmm, maybe I need to do something? The surprising part was, if we look at a different gospel, whenever Jesus calls a person out, something is about to happen. So, the Lord never uses anybody's name in vain. Uh, Zacchaeus was no, no exception. He says, Zacchaeus, you come down. I'm going to your house today. So here's what was about to happen. If we remember anything about today's service, there's a couple of things. And the couple of things would be grace and faith. So if we were going to have a little piece of paper and jot it down on your bulletin, you'd want to jot down grace and faith. Grace that's God's, that is God's life, power, and righteous power given to us unmerited and unfavor, in, in, in our favor. And it's through grace that God works effectively to change our hearts and our lives. So grace gives us a new life, which is not condemned by God. And then faith, which was being able to trust God so that we know that He has our life and it's in good hands and we find strength in God and we know that He is our stability. Right, so Zacchaeus is sitting there up a tree, but he still had grace, given the grace of God, and he still had that faith that something was going to happen. Okay, so the scripture says he came down and welcomed Jesus gladly. So this is the doctrine of free grace and the story of salvation about Zacchaeus being up a tree in more ways than one, and then that Jesus had an interest in him, and he had been watching and waiting. And now here comes Jesus. So it was like, bam, here he comes, right? And now the next thing you know, Jesus stops, calls him out, says, the keys come on down. This is the grace of God where salvation begins. Remember that Zacchaeus had nothing. He had nothing to give. He had nothing to recommend himself to God. Zacchaeus had done nothing to deserve that invitation to be with the master. He was the worst man in town, yet Jesus still singled him out. And that was Jesus' unmerited grace. So we move on to lesson number four. And that's a little bit tougher for us sometimes. So the Zacchaeus comes down and is welcomed in, welcomed Jesus gladly. And not only did he welcome him personally, but he welcomed him into his house and into his heart. So in verse number seven, all the people saw it and began to mutter. Right? And here's where it gets a little personal. Right? When we all kind of see something happen, and it might not be going our way, but it's going the way that person needs it to go, you know, luck falls there, right? Not yours. And we all start muttering. Mm -hmm. Right? So, he's going to be with the guest of a sinner, is what the verse says. In our Bible, you may have noticed the quotation marks were around the word sinner. And that means that they're terrible. They're, that's a big one. That's a gross one. That's the, the worst of sins is when they put quotation marks around center in the Bible. So you can believe that that person was someone that no one wanted to be any part of. So the crowd began to mutter, and even today we tend to be quick to judge and be quick to mutter. Um, so better yet, how can this or that people be a follower of Jesus if all of a sudden we're all muttering about how this person got something and we didn't. Isn't it true that by now that some of us are offended by the fact, or some of those people were offended by the fact that Jesus would love the worst of the sinners? So the problem is that the people are looking at old Zacchaeus and not the revitalized or the new Zacchaeus. And there's a lot of us that have made changes in our lives, and people see us as the old person especially if you haven't seen a bunch of folks in a long time, they look at you and they're like, oh, there's that old, uh, 
you know, and whatever it might be. You know, I've got a laundry list of things people could call you. <laughs> I'd probably call them all. <laughs> you got the wrong guy up here. Um, so in that laundry list, you know, you change your ways, and it's walking the walk and talking the talk. Not just talking the talk, you got to walk the walk, right? So that was the point of it. So with that, we move on, and... So we move on, and it's the, the background of Zacchaeus has changed, and because he's changed and he's new inside, people, it's just going to take time for people to see, because you have to show them, right? You have to be the new person that you are, not just say you've changed. So our fifth and final lesson on today, and we're getting close on time, so... Um, it worked out. Imagine that. I see it worked out. Right? So Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to your house because man too is the son of Abraham. And I'm sure the crowd in Jericho couldn't stand that. Some of them had to be offended. Jesus would be considering this man, uh, Zacchaeus, as the son of Abraham or a display of the traits of God. Right? So they see him as what he was or who he was. They thought he had been, uh, they thought they had, had it made and they had already counted Zacchaeus out. But the matter of fact was, Jesus was saying that the son of Abraham is not someone who has the right kind of birth certificate, but the son of Abraham is the one who has the kind of faith that Abraham had. Zacchaeus had that faith and he had demonstrated it by his change. So in verse 10, it gives us the moral to the story. Um, and the last part of the verse. So the Son of Man came to seek and save for what was lost. Why did Jesus come? Why is our church here? And then the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. So this, this scripture in this sermon is meant to be a lesson to us about why the church is here and why the church is in the world. Um, the Savior came to seek and save that which was lost. And in this case, Exhibit A would have been Zacchaeus. And so, even so, the reason the church was here is so that to follow the Son of God as we seek and to help save those who are lost. So we're supposed to be, and I think we do a very well, a very good job of staying open to making sure everyone is accepted and no one has judgment passed on for past sins. So, I'll leave you with this. We need to be living proof and walk in the walk of Christ's life, Christian lives, so that people will see the difference Jesus can make in our lives and in their lives. We write our own book and we can change every page as we move along uh, in our story day to day. Our book is not finished until our end and then we can never judge a book by its cover. Right? And that's that, why we can never judge a book by its cover. So a brief pair. And then uh, we'll be ready for all. Uh, let us pray. God, help us to be the living proof wherever we go this week and always. Amen. And with that uh, comes our time of reflection of our message and our time to present our tithes and offerings.